am Greg Jeske, and this is Postdoc. With us today is Ryan Nell, who was featured in the documentary Interdependence. Ryan, thanks for catching up with us here. It's been almost two years, I guess, so yeah. pushing two years since we last uh, talked in an interview yeah. up in your home in La Crosse. Uh, what's happened since then? Bring us up to date. Oh, man. Um, <laughs> well, um, you know, I guess the bi the biggest thing probably since we chatted last is, um, so I no longer live in my apartment. Uh, my partner and I bought a house. Um, so, yeah, that's probably the biggest thing. Um, we're in my office right now. So, I mean, you can kind of see the background. But, yeah, so, so yeah, we bought a house in Onalaska, which is a suburb of La Crosse. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. Um, and yeah, so that was a big move for us. That happened in October of la of this previous year. So we've been in the house now about five months or so. For what, what's the date? Five months? Or, yeah, something like that. So um, that's been really cool and good. Um, we did a we just finished up a big project in the house. So we just put all brand new floors in the house, and uh, that's been pretty awesome and a learning experience. I'll tell you that. No um, doubt. But the house was built in 1997, and it had all of the original white carpet and uh, white linoleum in the house all over the place. So as okay. you know, uh, white carpet doesn't, you know, stand up over time too well. So uh, it was it was pretty bad shape. So we just got that project done. And uh, so, yeah, they had some things happening there with the house. So uh, Ryan, let me let, let me oh. interrupt right there so I don't sure. so I don't forget the question. Sure. So you buy a new house, you're in a power chair for those of us uh, sure. who might be watching uh, who aren't, aren't familiar sure. with that. I'm assuming most people though have watched the sure. documentary. Um, what did you have to do to the house to make it, um, or did you have to do anything to make it um, uh, accessible for you? Sure, uh, that's a good question. Um, so we, my partner and I, uh, we started looking for houses and we probably looked at about five or six houses, maybe a few more eight maybe and um we we made a couple offers and they didn't go through and um i'm not a particularly religious person but um you know if you believe in in you know things happen for a reason or faith or whatever uh that sort of is how you know it was kind of nuts how this house came about so the house we moved into is actually zero level entry um it was built accessible for uh for for the for the original owner's grandparents, um, I, you wouldn't know this, but so we actually live in, in a twin home, uh, if, if you're familiar with that concept at all. So we share a wall uh, with another house, essentially. So it's two houses that are connected by a wall, and uh, we sort of have not a shared yard, it's two separate properties, but they, they're connected, basically. Gotcha. So, um, and originally, when the house was built, the the, the kids of the grandparents lived in the other house and they bought both houses. They built both actually. And the grandparents lived in the, the what is now our house. So the kids lived next door essentially and then the grandparents lived here. So we got in zero level entry. The bathroom was mostly accessible, accessible shower, uh, everything like that. So in terms of basic accessibility, we didn't have to do much. Uh, which was pretty amazing because every other house we looked at, it was like, yeah, this will mostly work, but we're still going to have to do $30,000 of renovations or $40,000 worth of renovations. Whereas with this house, it was like, well, we got to replace the floors, which, you know, is not really, it wasn't super related to the accessibility, but um but yeah, so it was kind of a kind of a lucky thing that we just kind of ran into this house, and uh, as soon as we looked at it, and you know all that, I was like, I think it would be silly if we, you know, didn't take advantage of this opportunity. So, um, uh, and speaking of accessibility, so there is a nice uh, basement in the house as well. Um, I can't get down to the basement quite yet. There is stairs, but we're in the process of getting an, of starting the process of installing an elevator so that I can get down to the basement right. and, and use that space as well. So that will be pretty awesome. That sounds awesome. Uh, and yeah, what a, what a great coincidence or fate or whatever played yeah. into the fact that you found what you did. Zero level, obviously, for people who might not be familiar with the term, means there are no steps. You, it's a straight roll in. 
Yep. So right from the out, right from the walkway outside, you just roll straight in, and uh, it's just a normal threshold, and you roll right into the house, and there you go. You're 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 inside. So. So, yeah. so something else we talked about in the documentary, um, uh, Ryan, was was the whole employment situation for people with disabilities. Sure. The fact that you've got a master's degree, so does your sister, for that matter, and you know you, you go through the, uh, just tons of interviews and very few um, opportunities are, are, are sure. given your way. Bring us up to date on your job status, if you don't mind. Oh, uh, so I don't know if I got a new job April of 2019 or what, what would it have been April? Yeah. April. Uh, when did we interview? So I got initially, so I, I started working for Newport April of yeah, 2019. Okay. And, uh, that must, that might've been shortly after we did the, initial. I think it was. So yeah, I got a brand new job with a company called Newport group. And, right. um, I, so now for the, since then I have been, uh, I, I was started as a, as an entry level position, uh, account services representative, which is long story short, essentially like a, a fancy administrative assistant. And um, my plan was to get promoted to client service manager within uh, uh, within a year uh, of getting that job. I thought I had the skills and the and the credentials to be able to do that. And I did get promoted just short of a year uh, being in that position. Right. So now I am in I, for the last six months or so. I have been. Uh, managing my own book of business. I have about 40 retirement plans that I help administer. Okay. And so um, I've, I've, that the job is not at all exciting. It's mostly just like looking at spreadsheets and stuff like that. Um, but it works well for my for the way my brain works. And it, se it seems to be something that I'm pretty successful at. So I'm just going to stick with that. I think I've found a pretty long-term uh, employment situation. So I'm pretty excited about that. And uh, it pays pretty well to boot, Greg. So, you know, you can't complain too much about that either. Um, that is great to hear. Wow. Kudos uh, two for two here between the house and the job, right? Uh, yeah, man. It's been going well the last couple of years. Um, I, you know, I don't know how much of that is related to uh, my intentional efforts or just luck, happenstance, probably a combination of everything. Yeah. But but uh, yeah, it's certainly been going well. So I'm just gonna keep my head down here and uh, keep working hard, and hopefully, you know, things keep falling into place. But right now, things are pretty good. Feeling pretty positive. The employment situation is good. The house is good. So, um, you know, I like I said, can't complain too much about where things are at right now. So another thing we talked about in the documentary that got a lot of feedback and continues to get a lot of feedback is um, your relationship with Andrea, your partner, your partner, and the fact that you guys run into this financial um, quandary in terms of getting married, getting legally married, um, because it would cut your benefits, benefits that you need, you know, that, that, that are very substantial and that you need obviously for, for your care um, um what if anything has changed there and just kind of bring us up to date i mean is sure. that still pretty much the deal that, that yeah. you guys won't be able to yeah i mean that's pretty much you know how we'll operate in perpetuity if that's how you yeah. want to look at it um I, it's just a matter of you know combining our assets will will significantly impact my benefits in terms of um, you know, uh, being able to afford my, my cares and, you know, um, yeah. there's sort of, and I think we talked about this in the documentary, there's a large gap between, um, between, you know, having a full-time job, like my cares are, you know, a few thousand dollars a month, right? So okay. more than my mortgage, let's, you know, a lot more than what I pay for my mortgage, wow. let's say. So, you know, to be able to afford those, I would have to, like to afford to pay for my cares, basically, I would have to, you know, base, essentially make a hundred thousand dollars plus in a year, probably okay. to be able to reasonably afford those and maintain a, a, a lifestyle, you know, the lifestyle that I want to have, which believe me is not extravagant, but, um, but yeah, so, I mean, there's just a huge gap between like what you, what you're like, what you're making and like what you would be able to afford. Like I, even having a good full-time job, you know, making, you know, around $40,000 a year or so, like an, like an average, you know, full-time job. And in this area, you know, that, that's a, that's a decent wage. Um, but even doing that, you know, there's no way I would be able to afford 
to pay my mortgage and my other bills and afford my cares, you know, and all, and all that, even making $75,000 a year, wouldn't be able to do that. So, uh, so you, you have know, to turn that job down essentially in order to keep your, the, yeah, the I mean, it's just a constant you. sort of balancing act of like, um, you know, how much money can I make, you know, is, how is it going to impact my benefits? And like, I don't have a problem paying a portion, you know, of, 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 of the cost. Not, if I, you know, if I'm working and able to do that, that's totally okay with me. Um, I think philosophically, I have some issues with that. Uh, but if that, you know, if that's how the system works, I'm okay with doing that. Um, and, I'm, and I'm not, you know, and I'm not, you know, trying to hide anything or, you know, you know, take advantage of the system or anything like that. But I think it's just like, as we talked about previously, I think that's just a fundamental issue with how we sort of understand people's care and, and what they need to just essentially exist is like, you know, how, how can, how, how do we, you know, put that on people to afford that who are definitely not in the position to be able to, to do that. So I, I think it's always a challenge trying to balance that out. Like how much are you making, you know, how is it going to impact your benefits, you know? And, and so, and, and the, the reality of it is that like my situation is pretty unique and um, in that, you know, I am a person with a severe disability that has been able to find like a pretty good job, gainful employment. And, you know, as you know, from researching the statistics, that is pretty unlikely just statistically to be able to do that. So, um, so I'm very fortunate to be able to do that. And so when you start to talk, talk to, you know, you know, benefits experts and, and things like that about, you know, how much can I make before, you know, X will happen? in that kind of thing, you know, a lot of those folks can't even tell you, you know, like, okay, if you make this much, this is sort of what will happen because the, the formulas that are used and, and the way these things are assessed are so complicated that like, you know, not even a, a, a you know, a, as an intelligent person can really understand exactly how it will all play out. So, I mean, that's kind of the interesting thing about it is like, we're sort of getting into unknown territory for me in terms of like what I'm making and like how that exactly will impact what my benefits will look like. And so that's kind of always a, a challenging and interesting thing. And so, so when we talk about the red tape with this, it's not just the, this sort of stereotypical, um, you know, uh, token, yeah, you, you've got hoops to jump through and forms to fill out. I mean, this stuff comes a long way just when you think, you know, okay, I've, I've, I, I, I'm to this point. It's like, oh, wait a minute. We, we, we've not even been here before. So uh, we, we, we need to take a whole new look at this, right? Yep. And, and essentially that's, that's sort of the, the situation. And I've been, I have been, people have literally, you know, said to me before, uh, you know, we, we have not dealt with a person in your situation. So, you know, we don't, we, you know, we don't even necessarily know how, how making this much income or, you know, having this, this set of, or having these wages or having this chef, we're not even necessarily totally certain how that will impact uh, things moving forward. And so it's, and, and this information has to be somewhere, right? It has to be, someone has to know, you know, like if you is make there a formula, if you make like $50,000 a year, then this is what you'll have to pay. This is how your benefits will be impacted. Right. But I don't know where that person is. Cause yeah. I, yeah, I, if they, I mean, if they see this interview, please, you know, let me know. Cause I, <laughs> I would love to talk to that person. So, so, so let me ask you, Ryan, I mean, is there a chance that, when when all when when you do find out how this all sort of plays out, that you wouldn't you, it, it wouldn't come to a point where you would be making too much money, but not enough money that you would actually need to not take your keep your job. I you know that I mean that sounds absurd when you say it, right? But you know I I don't yeah I don't really know exactly. Um, you know we. Wow. we I mean, this happens in sort of like, so when you reach a certain point, somewhere around $50,000 a year, let's say, um, you'll start maybe having to pay a cost share. So let's say that's like $200 a month you have to pay 
towards your insurance and your benefits that you get. And then, you know, when you get to 55,000, maybe that jumps up to, you know, $400 a month or three, you know? I, yeah. And so it, it all kind of, it happens gradually. So yeah. like, as long as I don't go from making 50,000 to $150,000 overnight, you know, it's not like it's going to be like, you have your benefits one day, now they're totally gone, right? right. It's not like, it's, you know, I don't, it's not going to happen like that, but yeah, I can't really say for sure. Like, I know how exactly, you know, all the benefits will be impacted. And I I would say you'd be hard-pressed to find somebody that could tell you that and give you cut-and-dry information on that as well. So, um, so just don't get too successful too fast there, buddy. Exactly. That's basically, <laughs> I mean, and, and again, not, you know, not to get too heady about this, but I think yeah. that that sort of speaks generally to sort of, how society as a whole just thinks about people with disabilities, right? It's like, um, whoa, like you can be, you can get a job. Okay. That's good. Like you can, you can make a little money. That's good. But, but not too much too fast. Okay. Just like calm down a little bit. We don't even know what to do with you. Then. Right. We, we don't even, exactly. And that's the crazy thing about it is like, we don't even, we don't know how to deal with this. Like we, you know, are, we're not suited. We're not equipped to deal with this. Can't we just, you know, can't we go back to just giving you eight, your, you, your $800 of social security hush money a month. And can't you just like sit in your house all day and do nothing? That would be way easier. Right. So, yeah. I mean, that's the message they're saying, regardless of what the intention is, that's sort of the message. So, um, so yeah, it's just, as you know, all sort of very, uh, can be challenging, interesting, maddening, exciting, all of those things all at the same time. So I'm just, I, my approach, man, just keep working, keep doing what you're doing, like take your raises, take your promotions, and, you know, we'll kind of just deal with it as it comes. It's really all you can do. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So now for something completely different, how's the all soccer right. team doing these days? I, I, I assume you're still involved. The soccer team, yes, this, I am involved. The soccer team is not, um, let's say, operationally functional right now. Okay, um, because of COVID. Yeah. Because of COVID. But we we met recently, and um, you know everybody's still engaged. The goal is to, you know, win a cup at some point. We've gotten really close a couple of times now. Last two years, we took a we took a sec we took a third and a second in our division at yeah. national tournament. So, getting close, but just can't just can't seal the deal, man. And so, you know, for me, that's not so much disheartening as it is just a, more of a motivator because, yeah. like, uh, you know, you get, you get so close, and it's like got to try again next year. So um, hopefully we'll be able to get back to some practicing at some point, maybe, um, you know, usually at this point of the year, February, March, we're sort of uh, getting toward the, we're get we're, you know, we're past the halfway point of the season. Okay. Uh, June is our typical national tournament. So um, hopefully by next fall, you know, fall is usually when we start practicing for the season for the upcoming season. So hopefully by September, October time, you know, we'll be getting towards that herd immunity, 75 to 80% immunized. I know, I don't mean to sound like a crazy liberal here talking about herd immunity and, you know, I, I'm, but so, you know, I think it's important that people get vaccinated and uh, that will allow those of us that have compromised immune systems to more safely sort of get out and do the things that we want and need to do. So I'm really rooting for getting to that point of herd immunity and hopefully that will happen sometime in the fall and we can get back to normal soccer operations. Um, I don't know if I had the uh, strike force when I talked to you last. Did I have the strike force yet? No, but you were going to, yeah, I think it was on order or you had, it was on the way. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. I, so I got the strike force and I was able to. Um, that's a, that's uh, a special, that's a special. Oh yeah. For sorry. Soccer. Yes. That's a, that's a, it's, it, yeah, it's, it's called the strike force power soccer chair. It's made by power soccer shop. 
those of you watching the interview should definitely go check it out. It's a pretty cool chair. Uh, but I, yeah, so I got one of those and I was able to fundraise and, and you know, do, get, be able to obtain one of because the chair is $10,000. So, you know, it's a, it's a pretty steep price tag. Uh, so I was able to fundraise and contribute some of my own money and, and was able to get the chair. And so that was really, no, no pun intended, a game changer. Um, yeah. And uh, so, yeah, that has been really great and certainly allowed the team to be more successful, which I think was the, the key part. I mean, obviously, it's great for me to have it individually and it's fun and it's good to have the, the, you know, the, the right equipment and the, the best equipment you can have to, you know, tackle the game and do all that. But certainly, hopefully, helped the team out and made us a little more successful. And uh, so that was really cool. And yeah, man, I certainly miss playing. Um, it's become a huge part of my identity, even more so since we talked. Um, you know, it's, it's it's like I travel every weekend, every Saturday, come from across the Madison to practice every week and uh, travel for tournaments to, you know, St. Louis and Indiana and Chicago and, you know, all those places. And, uh, dude, I love it. It's just – it's amazing. And uh, – like it's it's uh it, it's like it's like the ultimate drug man it's just it's there's nothing like it it's just amazing so you know since you know you you, you touched on it and that's what i kind of wanted to wrap up with i guess on this ryan is is just talk about what the effect COVID. and i realize that you don't speak for every person with a disability but give us an idea why how covid was was um was for people with disabilities uh well, was there anything unique about it and and you know i i think a lot of us got uh, sort of an awakening you know um but speak to that a little bit sure so i think for me it, it i mean it's just one of those things where generally people with disabilities um not only do we have a lot of times like comorbidities or other things that kind of enhance our disability along with what we would identify as our disabilities. A lot of people have other things like respiratory issues. Like I they're have more CP, vulnerable. Right. They're more vulnerable to, to the virus and its effects. And so certainly I think in general the disability community had to be on higher alert than the the even more so, which if you ask me, everybody should sort of at least, you know, until the recent past have been on very high alert anyway. But, you know, for those of us with disabilities and other things that make us more vulnerable, I think we have to be even more careful. And, and you know, we have caregivers coming in and, and, and other people that, you know, we can't really sequester ourselves from everybody, right? We can't really sh shelter in place like, you know. Well, you know, my neighbor's like, well, it's me and my wife, and that's all we do. Well, I can't really do just me and Andrea like we could, but it would be pretty tough on Andrea, yeah. and it would be pretty tough on me in certain ways, too. We got to have, a, you know, we got one other person coming in, two other people coming in, helping with cares. And so it's always nerve-wracking, sort of like, you know with more people coming in and out until again, recently it's gotten better as our cases have started to go down and more people are getting vaccinated and all that stuff. Um, but um, even now, you know, it's nerve wracking cause it's like, you know, is somebody, am, is one of the caregivers going to bring something in? Am I going to give them something? You know, we try to keep track of like who, you know, they're around and like who they've been exposed to. And luckily with my caregivers, I'm very close with all of them and they've been long-term caregivers for me. So I kind of know their families. I know who they're generally around, like those kind of things. So that's been a bonus for me. Not everybody else has that luxury, right? Mm -hmm. And I've been through certain parts of my life where I've had Right now, I am self-directed care, so I hire all my own workers and do that. But I have been in situations where I've had agency-provided care, you know. Uh, you never know exactly who's going to show up in the morning or, you know, things like I've been in that situation plenty. And, you know, for for folks with disabilities that have to, to cope with that, that has to be a terrifying situation because... I mean, you know, it could be one person one day, one person the next day, next day's a third, you know, so it's like, and when we're supposed to be limiting our contacts, I mean, it's kind of hard to do that when people have to help you take a shower, right? Yeah. So, you know, like it's, it's just yeah. impossible. So really all you can do is just be as safe as you can, wear masks and wash your hands and, 
you know, try to limit your contact and, you know, but what do you do? Somebody's got to help you make food, right? What do you do that? Right. You can't, I mean, it's just the way it is. So yeah, I think it's certainly a, a different level of concern for people with disabilities. And um, thankfully I've been able to uh, avoid COVID and I got my first shot last week my first vaccine so got my next vaccine in a couple weeks here and uh, feeling pretty positive about that and so I'm just very thankful that I've been able to stay healthy and uh, all that but yeah I would think generally they're just a higher level of concern and um, I think that most people you talk to at this point would say that at least those must have a disability so yeah that's kind of kind of where I would land on that I guess. And I am going to ask you one final question. Sure. Um, we haven't really talked about the documentary itself since since it came out. Sure. What, what did you think? And I know you will be honest, and this is <laughs> really the first time I've asked sure. you this. So good, sure. bad, and indifferent. What did, sure. what, what, you um, so I – so, like, it's kind of uh, – I thought the documentary was very good, and I – like, kudos to you for – the, all the hard work you did on that, and um, I thought that it it captured the from my perspective, it really captured the spirit of what I was trying to convey in the in the in the time that we spent together. Mm -hmm. And um, there were some things like like vainly that I noticed when I watched it, like oh I wasn't sitting up straight, or oh my legs were going crazy. I wish I would have realized that. And just because I kind of like, you know those kind of like like I said, just like the way that I presented myself. I wasn't necessarily thrilled with throughout the whole like documentary, but I thought my I thought the content was good, and like I think you really keyed in on the things that I said that I thought were really important were okay. included in in the content. So that so overall, like very happy, very good. I shared it with all my family and my coworkers, and everybody thought it was really cool. Um, and so yeah, I I would. Yeah, I think it was really good, and I think it was worth doing, and I, I hope that a lot of people have seen it. I am a little bummed that we didn't get to go to any premieres or do anything like that. That would have been kind of a cool thing to see people's reaction in person to watching the documentary and all that kind of stuff. But, yeah, overall, very, very pleased. Would would certainly participate again if the opportunity ever presented itself. Well, still to come, hopefully, will be that uh, in-person premiere, Ryan, and um, uh, keep that sort of as, as a rain check as we uh, – yeah. one more thing to uh, do post-COVID. Uh, yeah, we absolutely. Get soon. Can we get some beer there? That's the other thing I would ask. Yeah. We'll have to see. All That's right. Good Sounds good, everything. Greg. <laughs> All right, Ryan, I want to thank you for taking the time not only to um, share you and uh, and your and your life for the uh, documentary Interdependence, but to be here for uh, some more questions and answers. Uh, it was nice to catch up with you. Thanks a lot. Oh, certainly, Greg. Thanks a lot. I really appreciate it.